wanted a replacement for my thesis advisor, Martin Heisenberg, who was originally invited, and then uh, mentioned me as a replacement since he couldn't get it. And Martin Heisenberg is uh, the youngest son of the uncertainty principal Heisenberg, so uh, he might have had uh, a thing or two to say in this conference. Um, I'll try to replace him as, as good as I can. Given that there's uh, only 20 minutes of speaking time, I'll try to refrain from any interpretations or much interpretation. I'd rather uh, have a brief conceptual slide at the beginning and maybe one sentence at the end, and the rest will be mostly data slides or slides explaining experiments how to do it. The conceptual slide I'll like to show at the beginning uh, is essentially a reference to the ethological validity of the experiments that I'm going to describe. They are going to be highly derived, they're going to be very uh, seemingly unnatural and uh, you know, laboratory experiments, but uh, I won't have the time to go into the ethological relevance of these experiments that they have. We may discuss them at some later point, but right now I won't have time to do that, other than to assure you that um, they do have ethological relevance, and some part of that relevance is that reproducible behavior would not be evolutionary stable. So, uh, most behaviors are that noisy for an evolutionary reason. It's one part um, of that relevance of the experiments that we're going to look at. Um, so there's two different animals and two different experiments. The first one is the one I mostly use for my work. Uh, it's the fruit flag of buffalo that you can see here. Um, it's flying, in this case, for this experiment, this is originally devised, the experiment I'm going to explain now, is originally devised by my thesis advisor, Martin Heisenberg. Never really formally published that experiment, uh, so I can't give uh, a, a, an obvious uh, uh, reference for it. But the way the experiment works is that the fly is uh, glued here by a drop of glue between head and thorax to a little copper hook. That copper hook is being held by a clamp, and so the fly is flying without actually going anywhere. So this is precisely the way it looks throughout the entire experiment that we're talking about. And you see that the flies are moving their antennae, their abdomen, their legs, they're beating their wings, and their health ears, of course. But the only thing that they're actually recording is the, the effect of you know, the, the wings and the abdomen to some extent to generate torque. So we have a torque meter around the vertical body axis. And you could say that it corresponds, the trace that you see here is a 30 minute trace sped up to 30 seconds, um, corresponds roughly to right and left turning maneuvers if we would let the fly fly, which we don't. And so what you see is that uh, here the fly was attempting several <coughs> left turning maneuvers and then started to generate right turning maneuvers. Now, in a more modern, this is a slightly outdated slide, in a more modern experiment, the way we do it now, we let the flies fly inside of a ping pong ball. So we made a little hole in a ping pong ball, put the fly inside so that it would fly in the center of a ping pong ball that all uh, homogeneously uh, lit the ping pong ball from the outside. So there's no, none of the cues that people know since the 1960s when people started working with this contraption, none of the cues that tell the animal to go left or to go right, like visual cues and, and olfactory cues and sort of thing. None of that reaches the animal and the stimulus situation is completely constant. So any behavioral change that you see here in the absence of an environmental state change is something that is a trip you would call either an action. If you look at an individual turning one or those are behavioral variability that you see in the absence of stimulus um, variability. And so now one question that you might have is well, I mean that doesn't really that experiment in itself for Martin Heisberg, my thesis advisor himself, was sufficient to reject the notion that Flies in general and, and probably animals, and, and flies in particular, and animals in general, uh, are just passively responding to external stimuli. This was proof enough for him that um, flies are active and are exploring the environment. Um, however, other people weren't quite as convinced and said, well, you know, this could just be random noise. That's, you know, if you take an analog radio and you tune it between stations or you rip the antenna out, you'll still get static out of the, out of the um, radio, and you wouldn't say that the radio is active, it's just you know, taking what little it has and does something out of it. You have an amplifier in there and you get some noise that comes up. So, if that were the case, if it were as that simple, the simplest case in which you would have random noise coming out on a temporal basis would be a puzzle process. 
And so there's many different ways of comparing the output of a fly to a Poisson process. One of the ways we did, we did it was we looked at specific turning maneuvers that we can automatically detect and uh, just record the inter-event uh, inter intervals and compare them to a Poisson process. And the way we did this was to use a procedure from computer science uh, that computer scientists use to quantify the quality of a random number generator. And so we use the so-called geometric random inner product procedure to determine the deviation from perfect randomness. And the, our computer process, of course, is not perfectly random, like no um, random number generator that computer is, but it was pretty good compared to uh, what we found in the literature, it's okay to use. But as you can see from uh, the scale here, the flies were still, I mean, for uh, human eyes at least, and probably also predatory eyes, um, as good as random, but we could, using this method, we could distinguish it from a random number generator in a uh, computer. So it is random-like, it is probably for all biological eyes, it is as good as random, but we can distinguish it from that. Yes, John? So if you say random, there are lots of different types of random passive processes. Is this just comparing it to white noise, or what is it testing for? Well, so we can't generate perfect white noise, right? Because that's the limitations of a computer. But the simplest temporal process that would correspond to a white noise process would be the Poisson process. And if we had used the physical Poisson process, it would be zero. Since we used a computer process, it's not zero. So we can detect this difference from you know, mathematically ideal randomness. It's there. And it's bigger. This difference from ideal randomness is bigger for flies than for people. So they're, you know, they're random like. Call them pseudo random because a lot of people say that those are pseudo random number generators. Um, that's sort of what it is, but we can distinguish it from the pseudo random number generators, number generators that we generate, that we use. And those also vary, those different number, random number generators that also vary up here somewhere. Does that answer the question? Um, so now um, we've done a lot of other, I mean, it was probably naive, obviously, but that's how you start. Uh, to think that uh, a brain with about 250,000 neurons would be would, would constitute like a single uh, random process, maybe a whole bunch of random processes, and we did a lot of other uh, mathematical evaluations, and in the course of which we um, received evidence or hints that it may be the, the reason why the fly behavior is so reasonably close to actual randomness is that there may be a nonlinearity in the fly brain that controls turning maneuvers. Um, and so there was a method that we adapted from the literature with the help of uh, the original uh, discoverers or inventors of this method. It's called the SMAP procedure, which is a part of a class of nonlinear forecasting procedures that work in a way related to a, the way forca um, weather forecasts work. So we take half of the data of those 30 minutes, you take half the data, then derive, embed them in certain multiple dimensions, derive a mathematical model, and that use then that mathematical model to predict the second half of the data. The, the cool thing about this method is that you can tune a weighting parameter of that, of that model to make it more or less nonlinear. So you can turn it down to zero and you have a linear prediction, and you can dial it all the way up to what is it? and then you have a nonlinear prediction. And then you compare your second 15 minutes of predicted with the observed data. And the idea here is that if your correlation increases with the nonlinearity of your model, then there must be something nonlinear in the data that uh, is better explained by a nonlinear model than by a linear model. So if you would have a linear or stochastic, completely stochastic process, um, it, the line should be flat when we run these simulations over and over again. Um, all these analyses, they're not simulations, I come to simulations in a second. And um, your predict predictability or the accuracy of your prediction should be better um, in a, if there's a nonlinear process that generates uh, data where you can find this nonlinear signature using this uh, prediction method. And so if you look at the fly data, so this is again the same trace that I showed before, um, if you look at the, here's the weighting parameter, and here's the correlation coefficient, you see that the 
data for the fly is increased like that. Now, for me, and uh, for the other co-authors, of course, that developed this method, but for me, this was uh, a completely new method, and I didn't know uh, precisely, didn't understand precisely what this method was being detected. So for me, since I said I'm not a computer scientist, um, I got the idea of the concept, but um, essentially it was a black box. And it was getting something out that was sort of what we had the suspicion that should be coming out. So we, I was suspicious of the result that it was just information bias. So we uh, adapted a computer model from the literature that operated according to nonlinear principles that should, so should be, uh, should be generated output like that should lead to the same results. And this was uh, three nonlinear oscillators that were coupled in a way that you had uh, an activator and a right turn and left turn oscillator that were mutually inhibitory. And then the subtract, subtracted output of that looked, sort of gave us this left and right data that we could analyze in the same way as we did. Only that we knew what went into the data. And not surprisingly, because it was nonlinear, we would also get this slope. Interestingly, um, we can tune also this non <coughs> these nonlinear oscillators to behave less nonlinearly. They're still nonlinear, but they converge. The, the equation that we're going to see in a minute, they converge um, to single points. And then the um, values, and then the SMAP curve is flat. So it's not only that the SMAP procedure detects just any old nonlinearity, it has to have certain properties. What are those properties? into the details of those different traces. I won't have time for that. Um, so here you see the logistic map, which is the equation that we use to run these uh, nonlinear oscillators. And as you, if you know the logistic map, it's just, you know, it depends on the state of that uh, uh, recursive function depends on the state in the previous iteration and a parameter lambda. And if you plot the parameter lambda and s after many, you know, usually 10,000 iterations, and the parameter lambda, what you find is that this famous bifurcation diagram uh, with converging and diverging regions. And if we plot, uh, so if we use here the linear portion of lambda, then this is flat. And if we go to the nonlinear portion of lambda, or the chaotic portion of lambda, then the slope increases. So apparently, the, whatever it is that controls fly turning behavior, um, uh, it is. Uh, must be nonlinear in this way, otherwise we would not be detecting it. Now, if this is nonlinear like this, then this is what you've heard before, you have the possibility of these uh, nonlinear processes to be amplified, even the slightest small differences in the initial states of the system. And so, um, that uh, reminded me of a, of a paper that was uh, discussed a few years ago uh, about some physicists who said that uh, all successful practical uses of probabilities originate in quantum fluctuations. So here we have a system that in principle, we don't know if it does it, but in principle could amplify these sorts of um, uh, channeling, uh, tunneling and other effects up to the behavioral level. In principle, whether they do it or not remains to be found, but I'll just like to um, refer to the talks from yesterday and uh, Pablo Bilkin may also be talking about this this afternoon about free will and quantum theory. Now, how do the neurons do this? A graduate student in our lab has looked at that uh, and taken this slope, just plotted the slope uh, uh, as, a, as a group means. Yes, so I have to go a lot faster. And then just screened different brain areas. Those, so those numbers mean different brain areas. And looked if this slope would go away so the flies would be linear. And this was a random screen throughout the brain and found that, you know, just took the, lot, the lowest uh, slope here compared to the controls. And then we looked at what that, um, what that brain area actually was. Um, we reproduced the, he reproduced the results in a separate experiment with the right genetic controls for our genetic tricks, but we switched off brain areas. And uh, the important thing here is that those are two different lines that drive two different sets of neurons in the center of the brain. Uh, this is one line. In the R1 neurons of the so called ellipsoid body, and those in the R3 and R4 neurons. And interestingly enough, if you block those neurons separately, they don't show this effect. So you have to block all of them together to show the effect separately. You don't. Interestingly, uh, very recently, it was shown that these um, neurons, this, this, uh, not these particular neurons, but uh, this brain area, including these particular neurons, 
are involved in representing turning and uh, angle with respect to the environment in the fly brain, for instance, in walking fly. So, uh, stumbled upon this essentially through the screen without looking for the ellipsoid body, and it turned out later that the ellipsoid body is actually involved in turning. Um, another experiment that I'd like to talk to present to you in the last five minutes is this marine snail of Alicia and it's feeding. And it does that even if there's no food around. If it's hungry, if it's not hungry, it won't do it. But if it's hungry, it's looking for food. You can see the radula coming out here, extending, open, closing, and pulling it back. They don't see very well, um, so this is how they look for food. And they do this more or less spontaneously. They even do that, um, or parts of them do that if you take the ganglia out, the buccal ganglia, and put them in a dish and record for modern neurons, you see the protraction, firing, the retraction, nerve firing, and the closure, nerve firing, the digestion and rejection-like patterns. Uh, so they do that spontaneously, and it must be spontaneous in the dish because there's no sensory organ attached to the ganglia. Now, this is the work I'm going to talk about. It's a about, uh, work published in a, only in a conference by my good friend and colleague, Romuald Dajot, in France. And the important thing here is you see the protraction, you see the retraction, you see all kinds of neurons in the... Don't look at this stuff above here, sorry. Um, and you can see that these three neurons, they fire before any behavior happens. And any of those, if you depolarize them um, by any means, uh, they will trigger one of those behaviors. So it's very well known that these neurons start a behavior. So they fire, and once they have fired for a certain amount of time, then the behavior comes out. So they're controlled. Uh, they're important for the initiation of behavior in the dish, for the spontaneous initiation of these behaviors. And what you find, if you look at several of these uh, patterns, is that these three fire every single time in a different, uh, a different order. So how is that? How is that? Uh, how is that even possible? Uh, these neurons are spontaneously active, and they're coupled with each other, and such that you know every single time they have, they are in a different state, and they. Um, fire that in a different water, and there's a different pattern coming out that to us more or less looks the same, but if you quantify the properties of these patterns, they look different. Now, the amazing thing, and this is the last slide, uh, the last data slide I'm going to show, um, the amazing thing about one of these neurons is this uh, B63, is that it really almost literally plays dice. So if you depolarize that neuron constantly over this entire period here with four nanograms, what you see is you know, a textbook neuron would just fire with a certain frequency that's proportional to the depolarization. This is not what this neuron does. It fires, it stops firing, the total potential stops, and this is all uh, entirely uh, chaotic, chaotic, and random. -like. And they do that in the, when they're isolated from all the other inputs. Right? So that's an isolated neuron, no input that you receive from anywhere else. And the way this works is actually, the way the neuron does that is actually by a double pendulum effect of calcium currents. So that you know the double pendulum is a classic example for a chaotic physical system. And you have an L1 and an L2, you have two weights. And actually this is an endoplasmic calcium current that keeps oscillating, that's very well known. It's calcium induced calcium, induced calcium release for the biologists here in the psychoplasmic endoreticular calcium pump, ATPS. And they interact to oscillate calcium inside the cell and shuttle it out of the endoplasmic and this is the extracellular calcium, extra calcium activity through voltage-dependent calcium channels from activity. And so, if you depolarize it slightly, the oscillating calcium will, every once in a while, bring it above threshold, which will lead to calcium influx, which, of course, changes the intracellular calcium uh, concentration. Uh, 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 Nonlinearly interacts L1 and L2 in the same calcium and calcium. And so that leads to nonlinear chaotic dynamics, you know, precisely in uh, the sort of way that we would have expected it from the flight data. So that matches parallel research, converge on essentially the same concepts of generating behavioral value. And uh, I'll jump over that. And here's my final slide, um, conceptually, uh, but in, in the end, you make of these data which you think it fits you, but I would say that. This sorts of behavioral dynamics and, and autonomy and, and variability is something that would be necessary for something uh, that we would even discuss of whether it's okay to call it free will in humans. And if we wouldn't 
if these things wouldn't have evolved, then probably we wouldn't be here and discussing uh, whether we have free will or not, because we just simply don't have either. We would not have survived evolution, because that's what you need. You need variable to survive evolution. Or we would be so stereotypic that we wouldn't even get the idea that there would be something like free will. And that's probably what I would have to say. <laughs>